Well, here we are again for round two. This time, I have the pleasure of understanding what's going on because Julia is going to speak in English and do her presentation. So, take it away. Thank you so much, Mary. And again, thank you uh, to the Danforth Museum for having me. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be doing a bilingual program. It is so important to have, um, to feel a sense of belonging and being welcomed into these institutions in my native, native uh, language. Right now, we're gonna go for English. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> so, we're starting with the title of actually this series of paintings. I think that it encompasses a lot of um, ideas that I find really important, especially in the world that we live today. So speaking truth to power is a, like a long series of paintings, but we're gonna do a little bit of like a, um, a dive into my personal background and history. So I'm taking you all to Rio de Janeiro, where I'm from. And I just, you know, sometimes when I tell people that I'm Brazilian, I think that um, people, they, they hear me and they understand, but sometimes they don't have like a visual of what that means, like visually, what does that mean? And so I'm bringing Rio here because it is such a distinct, beautiful city. And here, actually, that's my building, I believe, there in the back, which is kind of funny. And here's the sugar loaf. So it's this really striking landscape and like the open street market. Here's also close to my house with like the colonial houses. Um, Are the sugar loafs the buildings? Or the no, clouds? this is the sugar loaf over here. It's oh. like this big mountain that has one of the most beautiful views of the city. Um, and then you have here people like having some beers on the street. That's a very Brazilian thing to do. And carnival, which I think is a very important part of our culture. Um, you see here just the sheer amount of people that are in the street. Um, it's very colorful. It's very joyful. Um, I don't know. It's just such a delight. And I've done it many times in my life. And <laughs> I wish people could experience it at least once. There's also many times a... Does it happen just once a year or is it... Once a year. Oh, okay. Same time as Mardi Gras. Okay, same yeah. as Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. And so, and there's always like a little bit of political commentary. So that's another really cool aspect of Carnival. And well, I like showing it through my own perspective. I've done this many times and here I am with my sister. Here I am with my mom. This is me just in the trance of Carnival. My father, my husband, our friends, my sister again, her partner. Either way, I guess I like showing this too to like give an example that it's for everybody. There's like no age restrictions, like kids are there, um, you know, grandparents are there, uh, young people are out in the street. It's kind of a, a really democratic moment. Um, I also love showing people the, the Federal University of Rio, UFJ EBA. It's where I graduated um, in the art department in sculpture. Um, and you know, I, I do liking, like making a point that making art is an act of resistance, especially in Rio for many reasons, we'll get there. But I like showing the scale. This is the beginning of the construction of the campus and it's just such a massive, modernist uh, complex. And it's quite beautiful, but it is a little bit too large for its own good. So actually this building ended up being cut in half <laughs> after a while. This is the hospital, university hospital. This is where I studied. This is the, um, the fine arts building. And I wanted to show that, you know, from up close, you can see that it's not super well kept, um, which is very sad because it's such a wonderful place that uh, benefits all of society. And But even if it's not super well kept, you can see it's so beautifully made, like the big, big windows with leaving a lot of sunlight coming in. The way the building's projected also brings like a natural flow of wind. So gorgeous, but then again, not in the best state, which, you know, it's a little sad. And Rio being Brazilian is bittersweet. I also like showing kind of the scale of the city. This is the, um, the highway, the expressway that goes to 
to the school, to the, to the campus. It's called Linha Vermelha. And it is a very um, dangerous part of town, if you want to say that, I guess. Yeah, Rio is very violent, unfortunately. And it's close to Favela da Maré, or Complexo do Alemão, which is one of the biggest slums in Rio, uh, favelas, communities, if you want to um, call it, you know, what it is, it is a big city, but also plagued by violence, unfortunately, and you have the military police here, heavily armed, people hiding behind their cars during like a, a shootout here too. This is not an accident. This is people stopping to avoid being caught in the crossfire. And when I studied there, I experienced that. Sometimes I wouldn't go because I knew there was a very bad shootout going on or a, or a war, so you just don't go to school, which is very Were strange. Were shootouts likely gang games? This is like a very um, broad problem of drug turfs and drug trafficking and, and just a lot of guns. It's a mixture, bad mixture, and, and very, very little social control over these territories. It's state control, which, and then just violence. There is no middle term. It's like people just come in with guns, and it's not a good, good result because it's just a war. Um, yeah, so I, I like showing this picture because I, I feel like it's very uh, emblematic of, of Rio. There's this little girl here. It looks like her hands are up. Actually, she's just like eating a popsicle. She's not putting her hands up, which I find so weird because they're just like standing there like so used to seeing this that like they don't even care anymore, which is absolutely insane and mind blowing. And this is the campus and this is the Favela de Maria. So Rio is a very, very complicated place. But in the midst of all this, we continue to make art including Carnival, which is like a big outlet for art. And then I take you inside of the, of the, um, of the art building, of the art school, UFJ. This is the painting studio. And I just like showing the sheer like scale of the space. And I guess we kind of jump in. This is probably one of the first paintings, written paintings that I've ever made. And it really responded to the scale of the space I was working in. And in addition, I guess I was making these because this program was very hands-on and I was doing my own reading because I very much enjoy philosophy and theory and I didn't think I was getting enough of that. And how do you share that with people without like tapping them on the shoulder and reading them a passage of a book? So I was like, hmm, I'm gonna make giant paintings that have like these ideas in them and hopefully people will interact with the paintings and will enjoy what they see and then maybe they'll be interested in reading this book too, who knows? <laughs> so that's how it started. And actually people stopped and asked me a lot of questions about these paintings. So I was like, huh, that's awesome. It's a conversation started starter. So I'm like, hmm, yes, I like this. So still, yeah. You said you started as a sculpting major, though. Did you do Oh, yeah. Did, well... Is that later? No, no. It, I was doing my sculpture major, major, but, okay. I did sculpture because I wanted to learn as many techniques as I could. So I felt that painting, I would never want to be a figurative painter. I, from the get-go, it never crossed my mind. I like materials, and I, I enjoy um, building things, and I think I have a, a 3D mind, a three-dimensional mind many times, and I respond to circumstances. But I was like, well, painting can be that as well, okay. right? But I didn't want to be a, like, a figurative painter. Yep. And I already knew that. Yeah. So I was like, well, let's do sculpture, because then I have, you know, I can do clay, I can learn how to make molds, I can learn, like, you know, tension and weight and all these other elements of, of building things and of thinking about space, right? So thank you for that. That's an interesting question. <laughs> but yeah, so we come to these paintings. Oh, well, no, wait. I'm going to make a parenthesis and say that while this was happening and I was doing my, my BFA, I was also uh, creating an artist collective uh, named Group Pi and we basically were a very 
open collective that was meant to create space for other artists. So this happened while I was in, in school because I realized that opportunities don't come easy in the art world and I was thinking, well, if there are no opportunities and we're young and we're starting, let's create our own. So we started making these exhibitions um, and, and then, you know, this happened and we made these exhibitions in really unconventional spaces like a ferry boat. Um, we had like 80 artists occupy a ferry boat with contemporary art, including some really big names in, in Brazilian art scenes such as Ernesto Neto, who I worked for as an assistant in his studio. So he was kind of our godfather and kind of, you know, really liked what we were doing. So he would participate in our exhibitions. Um, uh, Marco Chaves participated, I believe. Uh, um, José de Maceno, I don't know. We had so many wonderful people. And a lot of the artists that are in this group actually are doing really well um, in their careers at this point in Brazil and in the world. And we also had a lot of like um, organizing involved in this. Uh, from this collaborative practice and from this idea of creating these spaces of gathering, I also started working more like in community organizing, such as um, this moment when we were, uh, we created a committee, an artist um, movement essentially to demand um, the increase from 0.3% to 1% of the general budget of the country be geared towards culture, arts, arts and culture. And we won, we actually won that. So that was a huge victory. This is the then Minister of Culture at the time, Gilberto Gil, who is an absolute music legend. Uh, everyone should know his name, he's amazing. Look him up. <laughs> and then Joca Ferreira, the other really wonderful Minister of Culture that we had and we were able to negotiate with. This is us in one of those meetings demanding um, more involvement and investment in arts and culture. Also, we were trying to talk about decolonizing monuments and public spaces. And this was like in the early 2000s, we were really like thinking about these things that you know the, the kind of military, Brazilian military dictatorship past, past of like monuments and people that were being honored in public spaces was not what we believed in and not what we wanted to see. So we were really trying to get these spaces to be more democratic and more, um, uh, how do you say, like representing what we want to see in the arts and the culture and, and who Brazilians are, which is much more than, you know, a, a general on a horse. And this is Ernesto Neto's um, work. When I worked with him, this is in Holland, back in the day when I was his first assistant. So all of this was happening together. I don't know how, I don't know how, when I slept. I don't, I don't know, there are more hours in the day maybe? Yeah. <laughs> right, I know. And then I just like showing this because this is a, Another really important um, art space in Rio, it's called Parque Laje. it's a visual art school, and it's just really a gorgeous, gorgeous space. Um, this like castle, which has been turned into a, a art school, and it was the first art school that I went to even before I went to um, the university, and it has a special place in my heart, and I had the pleasure of showing my art there, and performing, and studying, so, just also to show the sheer like beauty of the city. It's such a, a gorgeous place. Was it like an art school that was for secondary school or was it a, a degree program? Like no, is it's open, the Pachilaji is open to anyone and it has painting courses, oh, okay. you know, all sorts of courses. It is, you know, for adults, for children, they have, oh. and for teens. At the time that I went there, I was a teen and later I came back as an artist, like already graduated, yeah. yeah cool. Which brings us to now. <laughs> so, and then I wanna go back to the paintings because I actually brought two of these paintings here today for you. And they are from the series titled uh, Speaking Truth to Power. And I have the one 
that's a little more colorful that is by Diane De Prima. She is a um, beatnik, uh, beat generation poet, and just really a wonderful uh, writer, uh, bringing all these beautiful ideas in her work that are very counterculture and sometimes centered on some level of civil disobedience and revolutionary ideas. I guess one of the beautiful quotes that I love so much is that one, as I pour out soup, young men with light in their faces at my table, talking love, talking revolution, which is love spelled backwards. That one really gets to me. I'm like, holy cannoli. How did she get that? <laughs> and the other one is um, Hannah Arendt, which is potentially more well-known in like the more intellectual circus, circuits and whatnot in academia. Um, really wonderful um, intellectual, you know, in writing. This is from 1945. It's called The Origins of Totalitarianism. She was writing it right after uh, the World War II. And I read this book and it hit me like a brick. It is actually a brick of a book, but it really feels like it's being written now. Uh, which I found really scary. And I think that this is a really important piece to kind of bring to light and have it be re-examined, re-discussed, and be in everybody's mind because, you know, we are at the brink of a totalitarian regime in many countries in the world, in Brazil, here in America. Um, you know, so we have to be very careful to not repeat the, the mistakes of the past and to protect our democracy as best as we can. Um, and as you may have been getting the gist of this, this series brings all these pretty, um, I'm gonna say perhaps not totally mainstream ideas. I'm hoping that they will become more mainstream in the future or in the present, but that, you know, that we are not uh, stagnant in, in any of the problems that we have in the world. Yes, the world is a difficult place. Yes, there is a lot that is happening that is not right. But we don't need to just feel a sense of impotence and that we, we cannot change it. I feel like we always have the opportunity to change things. So I brought this particular painting that I find really important in that sense because it is uh, the words of Ailton Krenak who is the Brazilian indigenous leadership and has been working since the 1980s and has been doing just really fantastic work in um, protecting indigenous rights, protecting their lands, protecting their people. The, their leaderships get assassinated. Every, I follow a lot of them. Every week you see some horrendous tragedy happening. So I find it's really important to to bring awareness and visibility so that these people are not fighting by themselves or alone and they, they have support from far and wide. Um, so in particular, this is from Ideas to Postpone the End of the World. It's a very short book. It's a lecture that was transformed into a publication. And it really like resonates with me. There's another one called Tomorrow's Not for Sale. And it's talking about how alternatives to um, the, the systems that we have in place right now, such as advanced capitalism and whatnot. So here's Ayuton, and a little bit about him. Um, again, a writer, a philosopher, and now he has been um, made immortal in the Brazilian Academy of Letters. So this is the highest honor an intellectual can be granted and he has just received this prize, which um, is absolutely, I think, unprecedented to have an indigenous um, writer and leader be part of this academy. Uh, so really wonderful to see his work and his ideas being uh, brought into the, the zeitgeist and you know, hopefully to the world. Um, okay, and now <laughs> we get to the project that I'm currently working on which is going to be um, shown in Salem. I'm doing a residency in Salem, which is eight months long. So I'm gonna be there between May and December of this year, of 2024. So essentially, 
this piece is a public piece. It stays out in the street, and it's going to be up between June and September, so come to Salem, come visit me. I'm an artist row. <laughs> really awesome place in, in Salem. And when you see this piece, you're actually supposed to come interact with it, it's interactive. And it's covered with all these little beautiful, uh, colorful ribbons, and all of them say you are welcome here in several languages that are commonly spoken by immigrants in the greater Boston area. And the idea is that you come up, you scan this QR code, and you can tell a story. You can tell your immigration story or your family's immigration story, perhaps, but tell that story and you know honor that and honor your own experience or the experience of your family and your ancestors. Um, also, this QR code leads to a resource list. So, you know, if you're an immigrant and you're looking for um, help with legal representation, with uh, finding a job that's suitable with like your training or your background and having trouble with that, if you are looking to learn English and your English is not yet what you want it to be, um, they can also help with getting um, English lessons and whatnot. So there are many organizations listed there that may be helpful if you're an immigrant and looking for this type of assistance. So definitely another um, good thing about this piece. And yeah, it's like really colorful and joyful too. Um, and you know, in my studio, people are also gonna be welcome to come in and sit down and tell their story instead of just like doing it quickly on the street. So there's that element too of welcoming people into a space where they feel welcome, where they feel um, that they belong and that they can you know, contemplate and think a little bit um, outside the busy hustling of the streets. And this is the, the QR that leads you to either telling a story or to, um, to the resource list that I just mentioned, so. And, okay, and I have to talk about this too because it's very important. When you see this, you're like, oh, that's so familiar. <laughs> this is the inspiration for this piece and it's in uh, Salvador Bahia. It's called um, Igreja do Senhor do Bom Fim. And people from every background, from all, everywhere in the country, probably from many places in the world too, they come to Bahia come to this place and tie a ribbon on this fence um, to make a wish. So this is really like a beautiful place to visit. It's very spiritual, it's very um, joyful in a way too because of the bright colors and Bahia is just another gorgeous place in Brazil. So I wanted to bring that um, idea of, of wishing and, and joy and color to Boston, especially when speaking about Im immigrants and immigrant populations, because I do strongly believe that immigrants bring joy, bring culture, bring diversity, bring you know new possibilities to the conversation. And basically, this country is made of immigrants. It's, I think the the numbers are very interesting. It's like one in six. People in Massachusetts, I believe, is an immigrant, and I think one in seven is from an immigrant family. So when we say immigrant, it's like a lot of people, mostly everybody. <laughs> so I love thinking about that too, and you know, not, not thinking that it's the other, it's us, it's everybody. Julia, the yes. project that you Ooh. took inspiration from, is that ongoing? This is a church. This is a public place in Brazil and it is just the, the fence of a church. And this is kind of a spontaneous thing that happens. It's, it's not like controlled by anyone. But it's been happening for years. Many, 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 many years. Okay. Yes. So where do people, do they bring their own ribbon to it? They're being sold everywhere, like on the street. Oh, if you're walking are. around, Bahia okay. is very touristic too. So okay. you know, you're walking around and people are just trying to sell you these ribbons. So or, that you yeah. can tie your own ribbon. Yes. Okay. And, and they're just like such a part like of Brazilian culture, like everyone that sees these ribbons is like, huh, I know that. And like, I remember because my father is from Bahia, my grandmother and my aunt would always send like care packages and they would always put the little ribbons in there, you know, as a gift and you tie them on your wrist if you want. It's a, it's a whole thing. It's, okay. but a very, very beautiful like memory, a very, very positive memory and a, beautiful place, so yeah, 
That's a little slice of it, I hope, being brought to Boston. <laughs> and then following the kind of roller coaster -y, um, like route that I'm going through here, I always like pointing out that I do make the paintings, but my desire is for these to live out in the open, for them to be public art. So seen by the biggest possible amount of people and just out in the world. The difference between the paintings that I do on canvas in the privacy of my studio and the ones that I put in the open as public art mostly is that I try to work with people that are contemporary and alive and working um, for the ones that are in public. So this one in particular is a collaboration with Eddie Maisonette, who is a spoken word artist. And I reached out to Eddie because Eddie is from JP and these are in JP. And so asked Eddie to, to create the text for these. And what Eddie did, I thought was super cool, um, he reached out to other community leaders because Eddie is very uh, involved in the LGBTQIA plus um, community, uh, a huge advocate. Um, so Eddie invited an elder and another uh, awesome person, Eric, and the three of them kind of created a kind of past, present, future. So I titled these now A Message to the Future. And the idea is to kind of honor the people that are doing community work and honor uh, their fight in the past, in the present, and hopefully invite people to join for the future. <laughs> and they are really close to a place in Jamaica Plain that was going to be destroyed for the, the highway to be constructed. I believe it was I-95, I'm very bad my memory with numbers is terrible, so sorry if I got the number wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was I-95. And instead of that, the community got together and fought really hard to, instead of putting this highway that would pretty much cut the neighborhood in half, they just created this green space like a park where people can hang out and, and enjoy themselves, and it's a community space, um, which is so much better than just a dirty, stinking highway going through. Absolutely. Yeah, so these were the Mothers of Action, and, and Julia Martin, actually, my namesake, <laughs> is um, part of this uh, here, or Mia Shara, I don't know if that's the same. Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, so these are, uh, yeah. No, these are uh, painted by a company that does it. This was a commission by the Stony Brook Neighborhood Association, and literally, like, I was not allowed to paint these myself. I have done it many times, but the contract was, we are going to hire a company that is going to paint this. So that's, you know, when you get to certain, like, projects. Well, yes, and also it's just, um, this is a, a commercial building, and I think they have very strict rules about what they want, the materials they want used. So, but then again, I created the work uh, and they just put it on there. It's, it's literally, they created stencils of this in order to make it exactly what I gave them. So actually, I, I made this font. I created this font and the font was given to them, then made into stencils. Yeah, so yeah. it's a whole process. Okay. They did not freehand this, like I usually freehand this work, but they did not freehand this. They made it uh, through stencils. Okay. Yeah. So interesting, right? It's like, yeah, yeah the process of public art. <laughs> yeah, it's commercialization, but it's what you want, and you want it out there. In this case, absolutely, yeah. because I want these people to be as widely known as possible. They're really wonderful people that do a lot for their community. So, yeah, the, the, the more the merrier. And, well... <laughs> I'm very honored that um, Iona Presley showed up for the opening, which I think, or the unveiling, which I think says a lot about uh, the, the importance of public art and the importance of, of honoring community members uh, in, in, in the community. You know, it's just like, okay, these people are absolutely, they are doing the work that she wants 
to happen. <laughs> so I think it's the, the kind of thing, and this is Eddie. Eddie is the person that I collaborated with. So it was, it was, I was just speechless. I am still a little bit, every time I say it, I'm like, I really admire her. So having her there really meant a lot to like support everybody that was working for this to happen and whatnot. And yeah. Are they still up, Julia? They are. They are. They're That's still awesome. there. And JP. Oh man, I, I wish I, I had the address in my brain, but I don't. Maybe we That's can okay. look it up afterwards. Um, yeah, and then another really interesting moment, I think, for these paintings, um, especially because like, the title itself, you know, it's like Speaking Truth to Power, and here they are um, right at the Boston City Hall in the Mayor's Gallery. So I like to think that <laughs> Mayor you. <laughs> When has walked these halls many times and seen the paintings up, um, but who knows? She may have a different entrance, but I hope not. I hope she saw these. <laughs> but you know, they were there with all the staff and a lot of people walking through, and they are putting really important ideas uh, into into the discussion. So hopefully, you know, somebody had a little spark <laughs> by reading these. Um, Julia, uh, yes. I have a question about the colors. Yes. Some of them are very bright and some of them are not. Like, even looking at these two? Yes. Is it, is it just your inspiration with the words? What? So the colors in my paintings, I think it's, it's important to, um, to think about what I'm using, right, the ideas that I'm going for and the ideas that the, the, the people that I am reading are bringing. Okay. So, I, looking at these two, I think these are very good examples because this book by Hannah Arendt is very somber and it is very heavy. It is very heavy. And um, I just decided that it wasn't possible to make this painting in the usual bright colors that I use. I really love color and I really love bright colors and I couldn't make myself bring really bright colors to this piece. The other one is Diane de Prima again, and I think she, she is so, like, her no filter, just really speaking truth to power in, in, a, in the way that a poet would. And I think that the colors there, you know, you can tell that I'm just, like, electrified by the... <laughs> yeah, it's so playful. Yes, yeah. exactly. So the, you know, some of them I think are more playful, and, and I'm working on a new one where I'm putting some neons in, on. It's um, a Julian Assange piece. I don't know if you know Julian Assange. Julian Assange is still a political prisoner. He was a whistleblower for WikiLeaks, and, and just like still in jail as a political prisoner in America, which is the saddest thing. But I'm using neons, and the first phrase is, this book is a warning, and it's neon. And I'm like, it is a somber, dark idea, but it has this, it, the title is Cypherpunks, and it's all about the internet and all about, you know, uh, instant communication. So I'm like, okay, this I can do neons. But something like this, I decided, nope, no, no neons for, for Hannah Arendt. So, and then, well, moving forward, I think there's a, there's a, tr a, a thread in, in the colors that I use. I guess they're always usually really bright. And here we see, the, the flags, and flags also have these colors that are like really um, primary colors, really bright. And we have here the Don't Tread on Me, the American flag, uh, Thin Blue Line, and Trump flag, pro-gun, generic flag, and then more Trump, Trump, Trump. And the last one is one that has like Trump on a uh, <laughs> tank with an eagle. And I was just, I had arrived to Utica, upstate New York, and Utica is a very interesting place. It's, um, well, I, I said a rust belt, which I think is not technically correct, but there's like a lot of abandoned um, industry, like ab abandoned factories, abandoned farms, abandoned houses. So there's a lot of ruins, and there's a lot of Trump flags too. And it started making me really uncomfortable, all of that together. So. I just created this I, with the flags, and this is the first thing that I did during this residency at the sculpture space. And 
I was staring at this in an empty studio being, whoa, this is so dark and I'm getting so bummed out. So what do I do? What do I do to reverse this? What is the opposite of apocalyptic? And that's when I had this kind of insight where I was, you know, again, I, I always like saying this, that like when you work with words, it's complicated. It's really easy to fall into cliche like Airbnb, nurture, love, mm, eat, uh, wine. <laughs> I don't know, like being like reductionist in a bad way. And I was like, I, I don't want to do that. So what do I do? And I started uh, usually reading books is kind of where I start. <laughs> and so I was reading the uh, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, which is a really fun book. Um, again, the beats are in there. Uh, Neil Cassidy is like drives the bus that these people in the 60s, super hippie people living in a bus in the 60s, going across America, a lot of civil disobedience again, a lot of counterculture, and their bus is named further. So I thought that was hilarious. I, I was there in Utica staring at the apocalypse and it just dawned on me that further, oh, wait a minute, no, 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 we can do this. We can go further, we can do much better. So I got flags that I believe in that I think are cool, that I like, and I created this piece. So basically it's the uh, LGBTQIA uh, plus pride flag, uh, the democratic socialist flag, Black Lives Matter, anti-fascist action, which is Antifa. And I always like to clarify that Antifa stands for anti-fascist, which is a very good thing and has been vilified but we really do need to understand the meaning of words and what things are before making snap judgments. So when you see that flag or you see that coming up, just remember what it actually means. And then the American indigenous movement flag and then the no step on snake, which is a joke on don't tread on me. <laughs> like calm down, Ch chill out. Let's take a deep breath, do a little meditating and then we'll talk. <laughs> And then science is real, Black Lives Matter, love is love, and finally the trans pride flag. And all of this to me encompassed like further, like we can do more, we can do better, and it's never gonna be perfect. That's why there's a, a typo. <laughs> it's spelled further with a U instead of an E. Further, not further. <laughs> I, this cracked me up and you know, sometimes it's like, oh, I'm laughing at my own jokes, but such is yeah, life. I can see the further. Ah, it's camouflaged. Yeah. <laughs> There's a certain level of camouflage and also I think flags are interesting because we see so many flags that we get desensitized to them. They become um, just part of the background. So actually this is flying in the uh, Boston City Hall as well. So while my paintings were in the gallery, the flags were out in the City Hall atrium. And it's so interesting because a lot of people saw these and I remember one security guard coming up to me and was like, is that the Black Lives Matter flag? And I'm like, yes. And she's like, oh. You know, and there's like this slow, realization behind like what they mean and what they mean to each person and and what they mean together and that they spell something that takes a while for you to figure out and you may not even so it's kind of a hacking and the hidden message almost i don't know here they are in just a little different view and on the street because again this is all about bringing things to the world to the outdoors to people so you know, I love making art for the walls and for the indoors, but I also love making art for the outdoors. I love the city hall put this out there. Right? I know. I was, I was, yes, I was surprised that 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 they did that, and I am very grateful that they did it. You're yes, right. that's that is truly um, freedom of expression mm -hmm. and poetic license, I would call it. Yes. So, and then. I'm gonna make a little parenthesis just to, you know, the idea of these conversations was to bring in like how we're connected to community and how we, we work with collaborative practices. And one of the things that I do is curatorial. Um, and that is one of the things, you know, in the beginning you saw the Grupo P, which is pretty much the idea that I've always had when I do any independent curating, which is creating a platform for artists that I believe in. 
So this was exactly that. This exhibition was called Sanctuary City, and it's um, a show with all immigrant uh, artists talking about their experiences as immigrants. And Sanctuary City, for those of you that know, are cities that um, somewhat protect immigration and immigrants more than other cities would. So for instance, Somerville is a sanctuary city where this exhibition happened. And if something happens like you're an immigrant and you're driving your car and like your light's not working and the police stops you, they will not take you in if your papers are not in order just because they stopped you because you have a, a tail light that's off. So, and you know, you'll hopefully suffer less persecution, discrimination, and whatnot. Not perfect at all, but a step towards the right direction. Um, but then again, the, the idea was to discuss sanctuary cities as like, are, is that enough and why do we have them? Why the need of sanctuary cities, not, why not change the systems that are creating the problems in the first place, right? So that's, that was the discussion, the big discussion that we had in this exhibition. Here I'm doing a little talk, and here's Raquel, my friend uh, and wonderful artist that was at the cover of Artscope magazine, um, and she's Brazilian too, I should say. Okay, now to close, very important that we close on a high note. <laughs> I, I like uh, bringing this piece uh, as a way to close because it, it probably was the most fun I've ever had making art or having a solo show. This was in Brazil, um, in a gallery in Brazil, movie. Now it's Se Galeria. They're wonderful, doing great stuff. So what this is... Julia, yes. can you roll it out so people can see it? Oh, I don't, the light's so bad. Oh, I think so. He can do yeah, B-roll. Okay. I think okay. he can do B-roll and that might be better. Okay. But um, so essentially, this, the exhibition started like this. Just this really, really big bunch of hearts um, hanging from an empty space. And then people were invited to bring in objects to exchange with me um, for a heart. So people brought, and the whole exchange, the object could be simple but the story needed to be good and like truthful. It needed to come from the heart. So people brought, they took it very seriously. They brought really, really deep connections and really beautiful stories. Some of them sad, some of them really happy. In this case, this was a person that had passed away and this person was not sure what to do with this object. They, they were kind of holding on to it, but then they decided that that was the, the place to let go. And I have this all very well archived. People have, like, I have it in writing, what it was, why, and I have kept these objects really, um, really carefully and, and lovingly. And, you know, some of the objects were ephemeral, like this is a sweet potato plant, and I received it because the leaf has, is the shape of a heart, and I thought that was really sweet. Um, yeah, and as the exhibition went, I got all these like beautiful little treasures and they started taking up the gallery and the hearts became less and less until I had, you know, a, a, like, I don't know, a fraction, a really small fraction of what I started with. And this, Julia, this project was in Boston. No, this was in Rio. Oh, that's in Rio. This was uh, a while ago, actually, 2015. Okay. And then, you know, I had leftover hearts. What do you do with these hearts that have been through like this experience of like non-monetary exchanges? They don't, I don't want to assign commercial value to them. Like, what do I do with them? And I'm like, oh, let's make an wearable piece. That's like, I call it the armor dress. So it's essentially an armor of love that like holds and protects the body in a like unconditional love type of situation. So you see, it's, it's meant for anyone, really. It's just, you know, whoever is in the mood for wearing <laughs> this, like, loving armor. Um, yeah, and I always like to close with this because I think that joy is a radical, revolutionary thing. And without joy, we get stuck. Um, and we feel the sense of impotence. And I want to, you know, try to break that pattern and hopefully 
make people at least for a little bit or hopefully for a long time feel that, you know, they can do whatever they want. And yes, we can change anything. And yes, loving relationships and, and community and collaborative practices and all of these things lead us closer to, you know, getting to a better place, to doing better, to feeling better, and to having a better society, a better, a better, yeah, life. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I'm closing with like joy and always a hopeful outlook and to not be fatalist and think that we are unable to, to do the things and change the things that we need to change. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, we can do it. <laughs> yeah.